just trust us. That's what the CDC says. It's starting to feel like Groundhog's Day. But this time around, the government is now offering you money. Good evening, I'm Leland Bittert. Every hour almost, there's another warning about COVID and each one raises more questions. The CDC still hasn't shown us the science behind the new mask mandate guidance, nor have they fully explained why if vaccines work, the vaccinated must wear masks. But that hasn't stopped them from putting out this map, which shows much of the United States in red, indicating that the Delta variant is spreading like wildfire among unvaccinated populations. And thus everyone, including the vaccinated in those red areas, according to them, should wear masks. Today, President Biden said he would consider paying Americans just to get the vaccine. I know the pain people who get vaccinated it might sound unfair to folks who've gotten vaccinated already. But here's the deal. If incentives help us beat this virus, I believe we should use them. Or some people might hold out longer to see if the incentives grow. The president wants cities and states to pay people 100 bucks to get the shot. Some people in New York are going to get that $100 already. Tonight, political reporter and Washington insider Daniel Lippman on the politics of masks and who ordered those not wearing masks to get arrested at the Capitol. But first, we're going to follow the science with Dr. Todd Ellerin, director of infectious disease at South Shore Health, a hospital near Boston where the mask mandate, uh, as it does in much of America, continues. Doctor, we appreciate the time. Thank you. Can't think of anybody better to speak with on this. Uh, have you seen the science behind these new mask mandates, or is the CDC playing hide the ball even with you? No, there's definitely science behind this, Leland. Um, there's a lot of observational studies, which are kind of large studies where you observe that patients who wear masks are less likely to transmit virus, and the, the people who are wearing masks are less likely to get infected. Um, it's not the same type of science of randomized controlled trials. You can imagine during a pandemic, you can't really create a trial where you randomize some groups to wearing a mask and other groups to not. But the, the observational studies, almost all of them show uh, decrease in transmission with mask wearing. Probably especially important with the Delta variant, which seems as though it spreads much easier, though. But have we seen the science about the, unva the vaccinated people spreading the disease? That's why somebody like you or me who is unvaccinated or who, is, who are vaccinated somehow should wear a mask to protect the unvaccinated. Right. So we know from the alpha variant that the variant that was first described in the in the UK, we know from studies there that fully vaccinated uh, people transmitted the virus when they got infected. There was vaccine breakthroughs 50 percent less than people who are unvaccinated. Now, I haven't seen data on the Delta variant yet, but the CDC is showing us or telling us that there is data that says that patients who are fully vaccinated are having very high viral loads. I can tell you personally from seeing patients who have been admitted to my system who have been fully vaccinated, they are having viral loads that are unusually high. So you get the sense that they will be able to transmit it. But I still believe that unvaccinated patients are likely going to be able to transmit the Delta variant more. Although, you know, those viral dynamics haven't been well worked out yet. But what I'm hearing from you, though, still is, though, if, as a vaccinated individual, the chance of me getting even the Delta variant is still very, very low. Well, when you look at the real world effectiveness in Israel with the Pfizer vaccine, remember way back when we heard that it was about 95% effective. Then more recently, about a month ago, there was data that came out that said it was about 64% effective. And then most recently, this is not in peer reviewed uh, literature yet, but they actually said that the effectiveness against getting infected with the Delta variant is about 39%. So that's a drop of, now remember, it's the, all the vaccines are still highly effective against preventing severe illness. But, you know, it, it, there well, does seem to be reduced it, effectiveness against, yeah. the, against the Delta. I, I guess at that point, though, and this is what the National Review had to say about this, they are asking the vaccinated to make another sacrifice to protect the unvaccinated. And in many groups, and many in that group, are those who have chosen not to get vaccinated. If you're seen vaccinated as the responsible choice, the responsible are being asked to alter their behavior to protect the irresponsible. You're, what I'm hearing from you still, though, is, is that as a vaccinated individual, the chance of me actually getting really sick is very, very low. Why am I supposed to wear a mask to protect people who've chosen 
not to get the vaccine. Right. I mean, it's true. But remember, at a time right now, we're seeing, you know, nearly 100,000 cases, uh, new cases of COVID-19. Uh, the at seven day average is in the 60,000 range. And we have half the population in the United States that's unvaccinated. And we're, we know that even when you're vaccinated, if you get infected, you can have very high viral load. So I think it makes sense that the CDC is trying to be cautious and say, let's do something as an extra layer of protection. And in fact, I believe that by wearing masks mm -hmm. indoors, if you're, if you're living in a warm or hot zone, or if you're immunocompromised or have a lot of comorbidities, we're going to be able to keep our schools open. We're going to be able to keep our businesses open longer. I think it will help. I, I think it does make sense, Leland. All right. Uh, doctor, we appreciate your time, and I know you're awfully busy. You said that you are already taking care of a lot of folks there, and we appreciate you making time for us, sir. Thank you. You too. All right. So even if the data on masks was readily available to all of us and the data on the Delta variant that the doctor talked about was readily available, of course, it would still be a political flashpoint. Everything is these days. And our next guest so eloquently points that out in a recent article. Wearing a mask is for smug liberals, and not wearing a mask is for reckless Republicans. So how did we get here? Maybe there's some people who just don't like wearing masks. But joining us now, political reporter, Washington insider extraordinaire Daniel Lippman, who also wrote the Playbook newsletter for many years. Uh, I guess the obvious answer of how we got here uh, in Washington, everyone would say blame President Trump, but it feels more complicated than that. Yeah, I think in America, it's a pretty individualistic society. And so, you, you know, we're predestined to, you know, people who came abroad from Europe 100 years ago, these were not the people who are rule followers. Uh, you know, these are individuals who are rebels in many cases. And so these are, you know, this is kind of our history of not wanting to follow what the government tells you, even if it's for your own good, which these masks and these vaccines uh, clearly are in many cases. Well, it's an interesting point that we are inherently distrustful of the government. We're inherently trustful sometimes of private companies uh, in, in many ways. I'm interested, though, in terms of what's going on in Washington, because I've only been gone for a couple of months, and the mayor said this, which surprised me. Beginning this Saturday at 5 a.m., uh, I will issue by mayor's order the directive that people over the age of two uh, what must wear a mask indoors regardless of their vaccination status. Um, and I know that D.C. residents have been very closely following the public health guidelines uh, and uh, they will embrace this. They will embrace this. Uh, is it possible <laughs> to find someone who's more out of touch with her constituents? I have not met many D.C. residents uh, in the last day, you know, last, last few hours that are embracing uh, who this. would probably want to embrace this. Yeah, no. And so a, a lot of people are saying that the CDC guidance, uh, you know, was probably going to change in a week or two and that uh, local governments like D.C. Are, are going too stringent. Uh, Americans have sacrificed so much in the last year and a half uh, because of the pandemic. A lot of people have lost their jobs and, and they're not eager to start wearing masks indoors when uh, they are fully vaccinated. Uh, and so anybody's. It, yeah, it no, feels nobody's like ever it, eager to kind of bait and switch here almost. Yeah, well, and especially as we talked to the doctor, that those who have gotten the vaccine say, why should I protect people who are choosing not to uh, get the vaccine? You think that the D.C. mask mandate strict up on the Capitol, uh, Capitol Hill, which is behind you, we understand uh, that the Capitol Police were arresting people who weren't wearing masks? Yeah, so they there is you know a sign that um, uh, you know that is in the Capitol, uh, written by the police, saying that if you don't wear a, a mask, uh, or if you're, you're told uh, that they are going to get ejected, and if you don't follow to leave immediately and you're not wearing a mask, then they will arrest you. And so, and if and you're, did, are they going to uh, arrest congressmen? I can imagine there's some Republican congressmen <laughs> who might, might like to challenge this. Yeah, it's kind of like those congressmen who got arrested when they're protesting Cuba or whatever uh, yeah. the hot topic of the day is. Uh, they won't get arrested, but they will be reported to the House Sergeant at Arms, and so it'll probably show up on the report cards. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know a number of them have gotten fined also. Uh, Daniel, I want to get back to what you said earlier about sort of the idea of American exceptionalism, American independence. We don't like the government being told, uh, telling us what to do. Have you heard any discussion from your sources about 
the messaging here from the CDC. They've been wrong about so much. It wasn't airborne. They screwed up the testing. Then we shouldn't wear masks. Then we should, on and on. Is there been any discussion about sort of how to try and increase America's confidence in these institutions that so many people just don't trust anymore? Well, I think uh, a lot of Americans, to be fair, have started to trust in the institutions, you know, since uh, President Biden took office because he's been able to roll out the vaccine that was introduced under President Trump and under uh, his, uh, you know, leadership and his administration, Operation Warp Speed. Um, and so, you know, with 69.3 or 4 percent of Americans vaccinated, uh, I think the Biden administration feels pretty good about these numbers, but yeah. they don't like that uh, there is this holdout of tens of millions of Americans who just don't want to get uh, the vaccine and are holding the rest of us uh, back uh, pretty selfishly, in fact, uh, from well, that. And so the way to rebuild trust in those institutions is for people to do their part uh, to well, protect. Or, or the way health. to build, rebuild trust is to give us the information to make make our own decisions. And your great reporting on on such. Daniel, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Lula. All right. Read it in playbook this weekend. For the first time in history, prosecutors have charged a Roman Catholic cardinal with sexually abusing a minor. It's hard to understate the significance of that sentence. A cardinal charged with sexual abuse. Pope Francis kicked Theodore McCarrick out of the church over charges he abused both minors and adults in seminary school. For decades, prosecutors took particular interest in a case from 1974. First came to light in January. This case is decades old. McCarrick was a priest in Massachusetts. And this charge makes McCarrick the highest ranking member of the Catholic Church to be charged in the abuse scandal. Bob Bianchi prosecuted pedophile priests and those who covered up for them at the New Jersey State's Attorney's Office. He joins us now. Uh, Bob, it, it seems as though this case would be very difficult to prove, but also incredibly significant. Yeah, it's got huge significance, Leland, and it's about time that we've gotten to a place where all the obfuscation and the bureaucracies are now giving victims an opportunity not to be shackled to statutes of limitation, which will be an issue in this case. But the prosecutors feel that the, the fact that McCarrick left the state gives them the opportunity to bring these charges. Assuming the statute is upheld, this is an extremely serious case because they've gone after the highest level of the Catholic Church, literally cardinals, in case your audience doesn't know, are the highest level that you can get right underneath the Pope. So it's sending a very bold and strong message. And I have one other message as well from having been dealing with these cases. I hope they go a step further and anyone that aided and abetted or transferred them over to another parish for them to continue to victimize young people are also being held to account. As a devout Roman Catholic myself, it's a black mark on us and we're tired of having to deal with it. So I welcome this prosecution. We like to say two things can be true once, right? You can have tens of thousands of really phenomenal priests who do the Lord's work and are great, great men, and then you can have some really horrific individuals who prey on the most vulnerable. Uh, those two things can be true at once. At the same time, you make a very interesting point, especially about McCarrick, in terms of those who covered up, those who enabled. And there was the movie Spotlight that talked about this very issue in Boston with McCarrick and with others. I'm wondering, has there yet been any kind of attempt to prove a case of covering up, of enabling, of conspiracy? Not, not in my view, at least from the cases that I was dealing with, with regard to priests, because again, a lot of these allegations don't come forward until years later right. because of the victimization of these people. So it's very difficult to put a case together. It's been through the expansion of those statutes and limitations where prosecutors now have the ability to do it if they want to. But again, keeping in mind, Leland, like you said, it's tough no matter how you look at it, to prosecute a case that's 30 years old, where essentially it's going to be a he said, he said, and the jury has to determine straight out on the credibility of the witness as opposed to having any independent cooperative evidence. I don't want to correct your math, but more than 40 years old. So the victim now yeah. would be somewhere in his mid-50s. Uh, it's an anonymous victim, but we were able to obtain a statement from his attorney. Uh, historically, this is the first time ever in the United States that a cardinal has been criminally charged with a sexual case against a minor. It takes an enormous amount of courage for a sexual abuse victim to report having been sexually abused to investigators and proceed through the criminal process. Let the facts be presented, the law applied, and a verdict rendered. Interestingly enough, you've prosecuted cases and investigated them. You've also been a defense attorney. 
who has the stronger case here, considering McCarrick's 91 years old, his victim now would be in his 50s? Yeah, it's hard to say, Leland, because what it's coming down to, as I noted before, is the credibility of the victim. And prosecutors can prosecute, just so everybody understands, just on the credibility of the victim alone. But there are some other little uh, things here where it supposedly happened at his brother's wedding, which is a documented event, so he knew the actual date. There were postcards given by Cardinal, former Cardinal McCarrick to him, so that shows there was a connection between him and the boy. So all those things prosecutors will use. And I'm pretty confident, having been the head of an agency, that I would not pull the trigger, if you will, on a case of this high-profile nature with a high-profile individual unless I knew I had it pretty well locked and loaded uh, because they could be really suffering a lot of embarrassment if they lose. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the edge to the prosecutors. Excellent perspective, Bob. The arraignment is September 3rd. Thank you. You got it, Leland. All right. An unprecedented possible settlement for families that suffered a life-changing loss. A gun manufacturer could possibly be held responsible for the Sandy Hook shooting. Could change a lot. And as crime continues to plague major cities, it's also having a political impact. We're gonna to talk to a former Chicago police superintendent who was intimately involved in both issues. Looking at him right now, we'll see him on the set. Then we are taking a deep dive at the dangerous relationship American companies have with China and whether they should be punished by lawmakers. As the deadline approaches to register for the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund, a look at how one group is planning to honor that solemn 20th anniversary. There's really no question that there is a crime wave raging across America. There's also no question that it is changing the politics of America's biggest cities. And that's going to affect your life whether you live in a big city or not. New Peace in Politico looks at that, saying gun violence is up across the country. It is changing mayoral politics. Homicides and shootings are rising, and the number of cops is down in cities from Atlanta to Seattle. Crime, as a result, is dominating the mayoral debates, as is police funding. One of those cities facing rising violence is right here in Chicago. According to the Chicago Police Department, when you look year to date, there have been 434 murders, which is similar to the number of murders in 20. 20 at this time, 438, although in 2020, the murders were way up. Aggravated battery declined by 7%. Criminal sexual assaults had the biggest spike. They're up 22% year over year. Here with me now, a man who knows both sides, the politics as well as the police side, Gary McCarthy, former <coughs> Chicago police superintendent. And you ran for mayor in 2019, as That's I understand correct. it. If the crime wave had been what it was in 2019, if there was as much crime in 2019 as there is now, do you think you would have beat Lori Lightfoot? Well, there actually was a big uptick in crime. Honestly, if you, if you take a look at uh, from 2015 to 2016 was the biggest jump that we've had. Well, I got fired in 2015. And, you know, I listened to people talking about why crime is up and, and they keep talking about, well, you know, the, a bullet, uh, the, the greatest way to stop a bullet is a job. And we need investment in our, in our neighborhoods that have been deprived for so long. That's all true. But what's changed dramatically is the face of policing. Policing is now being legislated. And if you look at the Police Reform Act here in the, city of, in this, in the state of Illinois, it, you're getting cash bail for murderers. So there are murderers who are able to put up cash bail and walk out of court. Fair to say that the gun crimes that we're seeing across the city of Chicago and every, t every time... Uh, no matter where you are, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, even St. Louis, where I'm from, especially there, you see these headlines, the number of shootings over the weekend are, are way, way up. Are these the same people just, you know, shooting, getting arrested, cash bail, coming back on the street, shooting, getting arrested? Is it just the cycle keeps going? Yeah, and, and it's, it's not that clear, but it's the same cadre of people. Uh, it's all gang violence for the most part here in Chicago. But the gang members commit other crimes, like carjackings. Carjackings are through the roof. People are getting shot in carjackings all and the, the time. And the gang members all know that they can have cash bail. So the, the risks of getting in prison go down. Uh, this is interesting. You mentioned neighborhoods. And there is certainly a disparate group of neighborhoods in Chicago, a very specific group. And we have a, a full screen to show this. We don't, as a matter of fact. Least safe districts in Chicago, Austin, Gresham, Englewood, Harrison. Uh, the homicide rate was 119 per 100,000, so that, as I do the quick math, uh, one in 1,000 residents is killed 
in 2020 in those neighborhoods. Over the past couple of weekends in Washington, D.C., we saw these shootings at Le Diplomat, which is a very famous restaurant right near where President Biden and Vice President Harris had brunch. And all of a sudden, there was this huge uproar. Is the reason things haven't changed more drastically with respect to policing is because the violence is still regulated to the poor neighborhoods? Um, I don't think so, because we're seeing shootings and robberies in the loop downtown here in Chicago. Lakeshore Drive, you see shootings all the time now. Places where, when I was superintendent, if one incident happened, you know, the world exploded. You know, what are you doing? How can you let this happen on a magnificent mile or in the Gold Coast? Uh, it's almost like we're numb to it now. The number of shootings in, in the loop um, has increased dramatically. So, th look, there's always going to... Th are there's you always seeing the change in politics yet that they've seen in other cities? I'm thinking about Washington, D.C. in particular. No, so, I, I'm seeing that we're still going further and further left. More progressive, more progressive, more progressive. Further defanging the police. Yeah. As a matter of fact, on a day when we had three um, mass shootings with 18 people shot, the city council was celebrating the fact that they voted in another layer of civilian accountability over the police department. They weren't even talking about the 18 people who got shot. The person who has your job now, the chief here, superintendent here, He's blaming the local prosecutor, Kim Fox, for, for this. Uh, when you were superintendent, it had to, it, you have to think that for the chief to speak out against his boss, because you're appointed, you serve at the pleasure of the mayor, uh, it's a little different, uh, and he's putting his job at risk now. Well, but he, he's talking about the prosecutor. Right. He's, he's not talking about Lori Lightfoot. Um, but I, I got to point this out. You know, in, in 2013 and 2014, we were breaking 400 murders going in the other direction. We're on the verge of hitting 800 this year, which is a 100% increase, obviously. We're on the verge of breaking 800. The gun laws are the same as they were in 2013 and 2014. Um, the prosecutor is the same as it was in 2014. Kim Fox was elected back then. Um, so what we're not taking into account is the anti-police sentiment mm. and the pandering politicians who were signing on to things like the Police Reform Act, yeah, like the giving cash, cash bail, bail. Um, a, you know, another layer of accountability on top of the police. Hmm. I yeah. mean, when does it stop? When are people going to actually say, this is what's happening? Well, Nobody well, is you're, yeah, nobody's no, you're, pointing that. Well, the, the political piece was there. We'll see if, if people start changing things at the ballot box. Is really the only way you could do it, as you describe uh, the and, problem. And, and Leland, just, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you, you just got to realize that I came up in New York City in the NYPD at a time when Rudy Giuliani became the mayor and changed everything. Changed everything. So, you, well, you've seen firsthand how things can yes. change. It's, yes. an important, it's an important perspective, great perspective from New York to uh, Chicago. Gary McCarthy, appreciate it. My Good pleasure. to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we all remember Sandy Hook. It was unquestionably one of the worst mass shootings in history. That left 20 first graders and six faculty members dead. It stunned the country at the time as well it should. Six years after the massacre, something that has never happened might happen. A gun manufacturer might pay. Right now, they're offering to pay nine of those families. A federal law gives gun makers immunity from liability for gun-related crimes. The Wall Street Journal now reports Remington Arms is offering $33 million to settle with some of the families who have sued over the Sandy Hook mass shooting, specifically about the marketing of Remington guns. Eugene Vakla is a Gary Schwartz Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA with us tonight to discuss this. Uh, professor, we appreciate you joining. Is this as watershed of a moment as it seems? No, I don't think so. Um, first of all, settlements are just decisions of the parties, often driven by money, often driven by insurance companies that tend to fund a lot of these, the defense of these lawsuits. Uh, they don't themselves set binding precedent. Um, to be sure, I'm sure this will encourage uh, more such lawsuits in the future, in some measure. Uh, but it's not like some court will say, oh, there's this $33 million settlement. That's what we should. Well, but what, what allows, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I certainly don't want to argue law with a law professor, but as I understand it, the, the Connecticut Supreme Court made a ruling that allowed this lawsuit to go through uh, despite the federal ruling, correct? So the 2019 Connecticut Supreme Court decision is a precedent. It's okay. a very narrow precedent, but it is an important one. So let's just step back just a little bit. 
Um, generally speaking, under American law, product manufacturers are not liable for criminal misuse of their products. Classic example is alcohol, right? Alcohol is criminally misused a lot, probably 10 to 20,000 deaths stemming from alcohol misuse, not just people drinking themselves to death. Right, but, but killing drunk driving and everything else. Drunk yeah. driving or, uh, or man, uh, and, uh, uh, homicides, murders, manslaughter right. caused by alcohol. We don't sue uh, Jack Daniels uh, for, for um, uh, uh, having for, for right, no, I, I understand. Being, uh, this is what, in this. what caught what caught my eye about this story. What made it interesting to me is, is that if you all of a sudden start increasing liability, even a little bit on private companies, they've got to change their insurance requirements. Their insurance premiums go yeah. up. Uh, perhaps the price of their products go up. It's certainly something that the anti-gun lobby uh, would love to see. Is manufacturers right. have to make these big payouts? It reminds me a little bit of the Southern Poverty Law Center back in the 1970s that put the Ku Klux Klan out of business, not criminally, but civilly, because they sued them because uh, people were killed because of their marketing, because of the Klan's um, incitement. Well, but it wasn't marketing. The well, their, was their, their materials and everything else. So I guess marketing. my question right. is, is, is this where we're getting with so, this very narrow opening that the Connecticut Supreme Court gave? Is there going to now be a way to kind of wedge in and start increasing the price of insurance and the way gun companies do business? So the answer as to how they do business, yes, in a very narrow sense. So as I said, with alcohol, with cars, we don't hold gun, uh, manufacturers liable for criminal misuses generally. Likewise with guns, and in fact, there's a specific federal statute that says gun manufacturers can't be, generally speaking, held liable for criminal misuses. The Connecticut Supreme Court said, somewhat controversially, I filed an amicus brief on the opposite side, but the court did decide this, that while the statute protects the gun manufacturers as to almost all the plaintiff's theories, it doesn't with regard to claims that the, that, uh, uh, the uh, defendants knowingly marketed, advertised, and promoted this to carry out offensive military-style combat missions against their perceived enemies. Hmm. That's the so, quote, narrow legal theory, close quote, gotcha. that the Connecticut Supreme Court endorsed. So what gun manufacturers now know, and most of them that don't advertise this so way, they, 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 they change their marketing. Is be careful with the ads. Got it. So you well, ask, will they change their practices? They'll change their advertising practices. But and, I don't and think they're going to change any of their practices. Well, and, and, that, and that may be a start. Uh, in, in one way or another. Uh, Professor, appreciate uh, putting it in perspective for us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You will not want to miss this story and remember this face. An investigative reporter will drill down on China's horrific persecution of millions of Muslims living in their country. We're going to talk to the man who is following the search to find a woman believed to be enslaved in a concentration camp. There's her face. And follow us on social media, at Leland Vitter. Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. We'll see you there. A little earlier this week, we told you about how the Chinese have tried to kidnap American citizens and bring them back to their country. Now activists in the United States who have spoken out about China's human rights violations, especially what they're doing to the Uyghurs, find that relatives back home in China have been forced into labor camps imprisoned, and in some cases, worst. I'm going to tell you who the Uyghurs are first. It's a small ethnic minority in northwest China. There's about 12 million of them. Most of them are Muslim, and like any religious group, they are viewed as a political threat by the Chinese Communist Party. More than a million of them have been forced into what the Chinese call re-education camps. You could also call them concentration camps. The group has reportedly been subjected to intense surveillance, religious restrictions, forced labor, in those slave labor camps and forced sterilization as well. And those are just some of the atrocities we know about. Austin Ramsey is a correspondent right now for the New York Times covering Asia. He was with Time Magazine before this. Austin, your report in the Times is incredible about what's going on here. As we understand it, they're, the Chinese are going to people who are trying to expose the atrocities against the Uyghurs and by the Chinese Communist Party and saying, if you don't stop speaking out anywhere in the world, we are going to imprison and torture your relatives. That's right. Um, the, there's, there's a long history of the, the Communist Party um, using the relatives of, of, of activists and people who speak out to, to try and pressure them. Um, but uh, 
since the the repression of against the Uyghurs has increased um, over the past few years, uh, they seem to be um, very aggressively going after um, Uyghur activists abroad and their family members. And um, the, the story sort of you did was absolutely stunning, and I would encourage anybody to read it. I'm going to tweet it out uh, after this. Uh, but it followed uh, Abdu Welly and his niece. We have pictures of them, and it's important to put this. The, a, a personality and a person to what we're talking about that's ha had to happen. Uh, Abdul Welly was the activist, and we understand, is the, is the niece dead? Yes, yeah. Oh. Um, she, um, she was uh, living overseas um, in Japan. She was a, she was a gifted young scientist. Um, she had studied chemistry at a top university in China and then went to Japan and studied at Tokyo University and was continuing her studies there. Um, and... She was. She went back um, against all advice, um, but it seems that um, her mother had been under pressure and um, had put a lot of pressure on her to return. So, the, so she. So she was an activist. Her mother was being pressured by the Chinese Communist Party and, and by the police, essentially, in a way that only they can. And her daughter returned, full well knowing that likely she was going to face. Uh, one of these concentration camps and forced labor and possibly torture and then died. Well, well she was, she was not an activist or her mother was not an activist, but her, her uncle is her uncle okay. who, is, who is now based in, in Norway is, and he's, he's, he's pretty well known. He's um, helped uh, expose a, a lot of uh, the abuse uh, that's happened in, in Xinjiang and the authorities have, have done a lot to try and silence him. Um, they put both of his, uh, uh, siblings uh, in prison, wow. um, in, including the race um, father. Um, they, 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 they've both been put in camps, and so Mirai, she went back, um, knowing that you know there was would be some risk to her, and, and she said as much to uh, Tabdueli, uh, who you see there, um, w when she returned. Wow, and and paid paid with her life for it. Austin, incredible work. Uh, please keep us updated on your reporting. Thank you. It's, it's incredibly important what you're doing. Thank you. Republicans are trying to pressure the Chinese to respond to their human rights and cybersecurity violations, now demanding NBA players cut ties with Chinese sportswear companies. Their products are often related to forced labor camps, but they aren't the only ones working with Chinese firms. Consider this. We have brave activists risking everything to shine a light on what the Chinese are doing, juxtaposed with American athletes who just can't wait to lecture us about the problems here at home. And obviously, American companies remain silent as well. Michael Waltz joining us well, a congressman, uh, also former Army uh, Green Beret. We appreciate, uh, Congressman, you being with us here. We, we keep hearing about all these terrible acts by the Chinese, and yet American companies just seem to skate through and don't do anything. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And we just recently laid their hypocrisy uh, bear very publicly yep. uh, uh, with the uh, China Economic Commission, where companies like Coca-Cola uh, refused, uh, despite massive evidence of concentration camp, modern day slavery, uh, forced labor, sterilization, forced abortions uh, on the Uyghurs, refused to even agree uh, with both Trump's State Department and Biden's State Department, that genocide uh, is ongoing. So I, for, for me, it's, it's just doubly hip hypocritical with the position I, I want to stop that you these companies you about have taken on Georgia, and they want to lecture a democratically elected state legislature, but then yet they just not a peep uh, when it comes to China. If you look at Coca-Cola in particular, a huge percentage of their sugar is coming from Western China. If you look at Nike and H&M, who tried to take a stand about uh, and, and not having cotton, now in line with U.S. law coming from Western China. But when the Chinese Communist Party threatened to cut them off from their market, everybody came. Everybody came. Yeah. Uh, and no. we're seeing this across the board. It is time for American companies to choose. I want them to make money, but they need to choose and stop with the lip service when it comes to human rights hmm. and take a stand and take a stand in line with our values. Yeah. Well, so. so Good, good luck on that. Uh, we know they spend yeah. millions and millions of dollars uh, up on Capitol Hill. I, I can imagine there's a lot of lobbyists for Coke uh, and Nike and others who are coming to you and saying, look, uh, we may not be able to donate to your campaign or we're going to primary or something like that because you're speaking out. Yeah, well, too bad. Uh, they could keep their money, 
right? Oh, but uh, I'm, Apple, so, uh, so they have done Apple it. It's that blatant. Is, yeah, Apple is one of them as well, and they've actively lobbied against uh, legislation that says, "Look, this is this is modern day slavery." We want to talk about social justice. This is happening, and you need to stop. You need to understand where your supply chain is and where you're getting your materials. But to the extent you know, cut it off, uh, and they refuse. And again, I'm all for uh, companies' bottom line, but enough is enough when it comes to our national security and when it comes to very basic human rights. It's gross and disgusting. And I have a bill uh, now uh, that's moving through the defense bill that's gonna ban these companies that are sponsoring the genocide Olympics, the Beijing Olympics in just seven months. Any company sponsoring it can't do business with the mm -hmm. United States military. That bill is gaining steam and I think we're, we have a great chance of getting it into this next defense bill. We're gonna make them choose. That's, uh, that, that would be saying, it, it feels uh, so much like the 1930s. We all said never again and it feels like at least with China, here we go again. Yeah, look, these people, the video coming out to show these people with yeah. shaved heads lined up on their knees, getting loaded into rail cars and shipped off uh, into re-education camps, concentration camps. Yeah. Uh, and now the Chinese are responding by dispersing the Uyghurs uh, outside of Xinjiang uh, throughout China in slave labor factories. Well, uh, and keep we're going to continue, we're going to continue to call it out. And these hypocritical American companies uh, need to wake yeah, they, up and put a stop to it. The ones you've named, Coca-Cola, Airbnb, Intel, Visa, Omega, GE, Dow Chemical, Procter & Gamble. Yeah. Uh, come, come back and update us on how the bill goes, sir. NBA players as well, striking deals and endorsement deals with these companies. Yeah. So these individual players that also want to lecture hmm. about social justice, it doesn't just apply to the United States. We, well, we'll do that. Yeah, we, we, We've had a few segments here about LeBron James on just that issue. Update us as the bill continues, sir, and let, let us know about those lobbyists coming to visit you. Thank you very much. Representative Michael Lewis. Well, Up next, he lost his brother on 9-11. Frank Siller is here ahead of his 500-mile journey 20 years after the attacks. Welcome back. There are a few days we all remember where we were, what we were doing, who we called. 9-11 is that for my generation and for so many Americans. As we approach the 20th anniversary, important to know that today marks the last day that two groups of eligible 9-11 survivors and their families can register with the Victim Compensation Fund. It includes those who died due to illness resulting from exposure to toxins at ground zero. One of the victims of 9-11 is firefighter Stephen Siller. One of the first responders who was at the scene to honor his brother, Frank Siller, started the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. Every year, the foundation remembers the victims of 9-11 with the Never Forget Walk. It's about a 500-mile walk that Frank is about to embark on. He joins us now. And what is surprising is not only do you honor the victims and remember them, but then you take care of their families as well. Yeah, we're, we're proud of the work we're doing at the Tunnel to Towers Foundation. My brother was a New York City firefighter who on September 11, 2001, uh, was on his way home to play golf with me, my brothers, and heard on his radio scanner that the towers were hit. So he drove back to his firehouse. He got his gear, drove to the mouth of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, where it was closed for security reasons. And what do firefighters do? They go right at the danger. He strapped his fire gear on his back, 60 pounds, ran through that tunnel, which is almost two mil miles long, came out the other side, came out the other side. He wanted to help and save lives, went up West Street into the South Tower, and while saving lives, gave up his own. And we started the ta Tunnel to Towers Foundation in his, in his honor uh, 20 years ago, and we're proud of the work that we're, do what we're doing, Leland. It's a, it's a remarkable foundation and a remarkable story. Uh, what are you raising money for specifically? What is the money that you all raise going to do? Well, so to date, we have, uh, by the end of this year, we will have delivered 450 mortgage-free homes. We take care of the most catastrophically injured service members, uh, those who come back with these horrific injuries that would, would have died on other battlefields, but have come back, um, and we build them specially adapted smart homes, mortgage-free. We deliver mortgage-free homes for Gold Star families, for the f young families that are left behind, who men and women who serve our country that die in the line of duty. And for fallen first responders, you know, one who died for our communities to go out and service every single day and put their lives on the line 
And when they don't come home, we want to make sure we're the foundation that takes care of the families that are left behind. So your, your, your listeners should know they should go to T, the number two, T.org or tunneltotowers.org. They could donate as little as $11 a month. $11 a month, we could take care of all these families, not just this year, but every year going forward. And that's our promise uh, and our commitment to our uh, first responders and to our military. You've been, you've been doing this for 20 years. Tunnel to Towers, because there's also the walk that you do, 500 miles. There's a lot of events you do. Uh, and then there's the tunnel to, tunnel to Towers run that you go to, that everybody goes and does through the tunnel, which is an amazing uh, thing to, to recreate uh, what your brother did uh, running towards the danger, as you point out. Frank, it's interesting. So uh, you guys get money, obviously, from these events. As I understand it also, Rush Limbaugh, uh, upon his passing, told all of his listeners that to honor him, Rush Limbaugh, to donate to you guys as well. Yeah, no, he, he, uh, he raised over $5 million for us, Rush. He, he was a great American. You, we all know that. And uh, he's been a great uh, help to our foundation. He, he helped us uh, incredibly. He and his wife, Catherine, to be quite mm -hmm. frank with you. Look, we have a lot of work ahead of us. There are there are hundreds, if not thousands, of other families out there that we haven't been able to help yet because uh, it's it takes a lot of money. Yeah, uh, and, you, and you have not you have not rested until you do. Tunnel tunneltotowers.org uh, is the website. Frank, thank you for all you do. Thank you, Leela. God bless. God, God bless America. All right. You ever wondered what kind of car God would drive? If you were God, would you drive a Chevy? Take a look at that when we come back. We do endeavor to answer the biggest questions of the day here. Every night, work hard at it, big team. But there are some questions so significant, so enduring, that we must turn to Twitter. Tonight's question, what kind of car would God drive? In Maryland, evidently he drives a Chevy Cruze. You can see the vanity license plate, God. Our friend Larry O'Connor took this shot and tweeted the quote from Larry, I didn't expect him to drive a Chevy, nor did we. Although there is a Twitter account, the tweet of God, we asked for a comment on God's choice of wheels and have not heard back as of yet. We'll let you know tomorrow if that changes.